Hi. Hi. I'm Nene. Uh, I really, really like thinking. And I really, really like thinking in visuals. And I'm a horrible artist. So I have a whiteboard and I will do my best to draw what I'm thinking about. And um, I apologize in advance for my horrific drawing skills. Um, so, okay. I am very interested in things like gender, in things like relationships, in things like alternative styles of relationships, in things like alternative styles of being in relationships. You can see where you're like, ah, oh, sorry. Um, and, 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 and right, and so like, and these are actually really difficult things to talk about with other people because of all kinds of reasons that we've been discussing for like three days <laughs> at this conference and some things we haven't been discussing for much at this conference. So I've been writing about this stuff for a long time and in so doing I came up with a lot of ways to try to make clear to people who I was, who I wanted to be with, who I wanted to have experiences with, what those experiences needed to be like for me to feel satisfied in them try to understand what they wanted their experiences to feel satisfied with their experiences with me, and so on and so forth. And so that's what I wanna I wanna start to share with you. And I wanna start doing so by drawing graphs. Because I like graphs and infographics of all kinds. So we're all probably very familiar with this concept, right? Does this look familiar to anybody? Yes. Yeah. This is a binary. We break for computers. Really, really, really coarse for people. Binaries, of course, come in all kinds of varieties. We have gender binaries for male and female. This is an obvious binary, right? Male, female. Can you think of some others? Attraction. Uh, other, other binaries. Black, white, yeah, black, white. Good and evil, straight and gay, right? Oops, straight and gay. Okay. Married, single. Married, single, great. Very, very easy to come with binaries. It's kind of like all around. Binaries don't give you a lot of options. They give you actually two options. That's the exact number of options they give you. No more and no less. In when I was a teenager, I was thinking about both of these, right? Straight, gay, male, female. Neither of them really fit perfectly, and this was really, really confusing um, for a lot of reasons. It was also very painful for a lot of reasons because I didn't understand what else there was possible. And then I came across this amazing concept called the Kinsey scale. How many of you remember the Kinsey scale? Awesome, this is gonna be great. Um, so the Kinsey scale, right, is uh, Alfred Kinsey came up with this uh, to describe gradations between straight and gay, homosexual and heterosexual experiences. And so the Kinsey scale came up with, ooh, I have one of these now. The Kinsey scale, when I found this on the internet, looked something like this, ooh, except, you know, more symmetrical, symmetrical and less awfully drawn. I think that's right. Um, zero to six. Straight, okay. And the amazing concept about the Kinsey scale, of course, is that there are gradations between the binary. And so now we have this amazing concept called bi, I cannot write that way, bisexual. So I saw this and I was like, oh, hey, maybe that's me. What are the limits of this? Um, the limits are that not everybody falls into male or female, and so what are you if you are attracted to people who fall somewhere else? Yep. Can you think about this? About, um, because the Kinsey scale has to do with experience, so what if you're asexual and just your attraction to other people doesn't include that? Right. So this is talking specifically and only about sexual orientation. The whole notion of 
male and female here is embedded, but doesn't actually get addressed by this thing, by, 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 by the Kinsey scale itself. What it does let us do is create It gives us the concept of a specter. So now we have this tool, which is wonderful. Because a spectrum can be applied to anything we want. Here's the idea in the spectrum. Let's put this back to email here and mail here. Right? Here, let's say this is 20%, and this will have 80%, and this will be 50% in the middle. Right? That looks very, very simple and familiar, number line kind of style. Now, I guess I could be 50% male, or would I be 50% female? If I was here. If this were Mei how do I draw Mei I draw three years like this. That's Mei <laughs> Making sense so far? Would I be 50% male or 50% female? Well, both. Neither. Neither. Both. neither. both neither. Any other answers? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> 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 it depends on how you we come up with the same problem, huh? Yes. This also doesn't actually tell us or cover all the ways that we could possibly think about ourselves. This spectrum, while useful, is still kind of limiting. The other thing that's limiting about this spectrum, or a spectrum like this, can be observed if I were, not here, but let's say here. What happens if I move from this point to this point, and I now at 20% male. So now May May is 20% male here, which means 80% female. And what happens if I go to this side and then now here? What happens? That would be 80% male. 80% female. Male. Thank you, that's a good point. Yeah, that's what confused me about this. <laughs> that's what I should have done. If this is like this gets the spectrum of how much male I am. Thank you for that. Right? So if I'm if I'm if I'm this much male and I'm here, then 20% male and 80% female. If I'm this much male, whatever the spectrum says, but I'm at this point. How much male am I and how much female, female am I? 80% male. I have to become more of one thing and less of the other thing in exact proportion to each other. Mm. That sucks. <laughs> <laughs> and feels limiting. So that's a problem with the spectrum. Now, in this was this was a, this this was for a very long time one of the only or main ways that I've heard people talk about gender, the gender spectrum, right? That tool, however, is itself very crude. And so when we talked about the gender spectrum and you know, we're hashing this out and we being like the internet community of people who are talking about these sorts of things, um, there came up with this very amazing, diverse uh, number of different ways of thinking about gender. Things like color wheels, things like um, uh, uh, diodes, right? People came up with all sorts of fascinating interfaces. Some people actually wrote web pages where you can self-identify your gender and they have checkboxes of like 984 options and you can combine those checkboxes with any number of options. And these things were absolutely, unbelievably awesome and totally overwhelming and completely confusing and in no way possible for me to look at and actually get any idea of what I'm, how to like read this stuff. But it's fun checking out. Check out the Yay Gender Form website. Um, if you Google that, you'll, you'll find stuff, and that'll be a lot of fun to just play with a little bit. It gives you a little badge you can put on your website. It's cute. Um, but, we, but, but we need some more tools. And so from a, from a discussion on a site called genderfork.com, which 
was made by an amazing person named Sarah Dobb in San Francisco, um, came this concept from actually um, one of my ex-partners called additive gender. And additive gender simply takes this spectrum, and instead of putting female here, puts it here. And now we have two spectrums. This tool, I like labels because they're useful for communicating things. All right. This tool, what if now I'm 50% male? So let's take these out here. Where am I on this spectrum? 50%. <laughs> I can be anywhere I want. And that's what's wonderful about this, right? I can be 20%. And I can be 80%. 80%. And now, I'm like Johnny again. There we go. And now, I can be both 50% male and 80% female. How many percent is that? 120 or something. It's 50 and it's 80. It's 50 and it's 80. It's 130. Okay. We're coming into another. Oh, do you have anything? Yeah, I. The concept of zero sum is percolating in my head, and as you move away from it. Uh -huh. um, the, the previous charts, you know, male, female, where are you? You know, turn it into a zero to sum uh, kind of kind of system, where here you're just saying these are characteristics and how much of each characteristic. And you can have lots of characteristics. You can have another line for proneness of hair. You can be very high on that one. <laughs> but, uh, I would be very high on that one. <laughs> the, 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 Not only for proneness, but also amount of hair. <laughs> yes. I still see a binary in that we're just talking about male and female mm -hmm. because there, there are people I'm told that don't identify as male or female but as something else. So wouldn't there need to be another, at least one more spectrum? Yeah, that's the hair color. No. Something, <laughs> something gender related that's not male and not female. Do you see the problem we're getting into here? We're coming back with uh, those, one of those long, high amount of button diode node things, right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's cool and awesome, and a good way to describe a characteristic, per se. But it's not exactly a way to visualize sexual self-identity, right? Let's, get, let's go even, even further than this. So the thing about these sorts of things, these sorts of scales or spectrums. Oh, did anyone else have anything else to say before I move? Okay, questions? Excited comments? <laughs> you think it's good? We got male female for 15 minutes, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, good point. <laughs> yeah, and that's actually, that's a good point. You're already raising the, the really good point that, you know, well, this is still right by now, right? This is a conversation that in about, about 15 minutes, sometimes, takes people outside of these walls their lifetime to have. So first of all, congratulate yourselves. That's awesome. Second of all, hey, yeah, why not? Second of all, understand also that what we're doing is these are all frameworks and these will be limiting to some degree. But there are also communicative tools you can use to have these conversations drawn and or talked about with people with whom uh, these conversations are more difficult or some, somewhat more challenging. Um, so think about that too while, while, while we do this. All right, so here's the thing. That's, that happens when we have these kinds of lines. We can either look at those many, many, many lines, and we have all those many lines overwhelming us with all these different numbers of diodes and things. And we also see that we have any number of like places to be on those lines, right? We're in a poly conference. I have seen a fantastic little diagram called the poly mono scale. 
It's essentially the Kinsey scale, except instead of heterosexual, homosexual, it's monogamous and polyamorous. Again, it takes that, that, that concept and gives us a, a gradation. And maybe here, poly-ish, mono-ish. What's Dan Savage's word? Monogamish? Monogamish. Um, I don't think he uses it the way, I don't think that word means what he thinks it means. Um, <laughs> sorry, Dan. Um, that's true. Um, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, okay, so 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 you can be any part of those you know, pieces on, on those lines, and we have this this concept right in the middle there, uh, uh, with um, uh, sexuality. It's bisexual with poly mono. I don't know if there's a term, but it's a term for like bi poly, like poly half. I don't know. Um, the other thing, right, that we could do binaries with, and this is very important to me in my personal sexuality, is dominant and submissive, right? So again, we have D. And S, and the whole thing happens all the way again with, with, with this characteristic instead. But we also, in power play, and power and authority, authority play, really, power exchange, I like to call authority play, we have this concept called a switch, which is kind of like bisexual, sort of looks the same if we think about it in those terms. But we also have this concept of vanilla, right? I'm not interested in any of that. So we actually have four. If you look at that line, right, you only have the three main points and then we have those, those bits that have to go, uh, that, that, that necessarily detract from the others. But if we make it like, if we drew it like this, now we have four cardinal directions. Dominant, submissive, Switch for all the fucked upness that that word necessarily entails. Um, and we have egalitarian or vanilla. Yes. Vanilla. And this, I cannot actually draw upside down. I keep trying and I fail. Okay. Right? Is a circle. Which I'll put in the square because why not? <laughs> this concept gives us all the same characteristics of the spectrum, except that it has four actual primary, like, you know, real points to look at. What if you're here? It can be dominant ish. I am somewhere around here. Mostly, mostly submissive, almost exclusively so, with a little bit of not so much towards switchiness. Is this making sense? Yes. 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 Yeah. <coughs> I mean, you're not you see. Um, what if you are a bit switch, but also a bit vanilla? Like, I mean, that there's not really any way to. <laughs> so one way to say that is that we still have opposites, mm -hmm. and opposites give us binaries. Mm -hmm. Okay, good point. Um, anyone else have more comments on this? It kind of looks. I was thinking of the in the string theory formula where, like physics. Yes. Oh, this is gonna be good. <laughs> 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 no, go ahead, do it. This is awesome. Come on, string theory. Um, string theory basically was first thought of as a flat level surface, and then they saw that what they thought started to wiggle. Mm -hmm. And then I forgot who it was decided, wait a minute, we're not look, we're not looking like this at it. We're looking at it like this, and then when you when you see your t it's tilted. You can see everything that's it's all vibrating at a constant flux. And then all of a sudden, one area of it has a little bit heavier gravity pulled down on it. So things start yeah. evolving around that deep gravity pull. And that's where you can say the four points of the board. At any point in time, any, any body in space can be attracted to a, a piece of gra a gravity pull. That's and then all of a sudden, 
it be pulled to another point of gravity. So you said a very key word there, which was attracted. Right? Um, yes, that's awesome. And I'm so glad that you're like, mentioning that because we're kind of headed in that direction. Um, so thank you for bringing that up. I want to get there one step at a time, though. So I saw one more oh, the other hand up. Oh. It was me, I think. Thing, thing, same thing. Okay. But in smaller words. <laughs> so I'll say it anyway, and you can tell me if it's the same thing. Um, this is one dimensional. Mm -hmm. It assumes that you're going to be at the same point in this for all possible other people that you're relating with. Um, if you considered it instead of a circle as a tube, like you know, the inside of the paper roll, mm -hmm. and that uh, you might be at different places on yeah. this infinite series of circles, depending on who was at that point in the slice, and so who you were relating to. Um, like, for example, okay, me, I consider myself a service switch. Um, parse that one. <laughs> yes, let's let's parse that one. You know, and, and it depends on who I'm connecting to. Right. So there's a word for this in, in we're, we're heading that direction, right? Um, in, in graph visualization, like practice. So I, I talked to a bunch of, of like computer animators about this, and they were like, "Oh, what you need is a force directed graph," as if that was obvious. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. Thanks for telling me. Now I know it's a force directed graph. A force directed graph is a graph that shows you the perspective of the object that you are looking at, rather than right. Exactly. So so here, back to this, we have these two problems that that uh, that you pointed out, um, and that you both pointed out. We have this binary, right? We have this binary, mm -hmm. and we have this whole 1D problem. One dimension, if I could fit in one dimension. <laughs> All right, so let's move on beyond this. Right, if, and one more thing. One other thought. I thought I heard somebody say it. Um, I didn't see us limited to a circle, but rather a disk. So the opposite of the switch and the vanilla weren't an issue because you could simply move from switch inside a little bit. Yeah, when I was thinking that that would have made more sense, but it still was problematic. Like, it, it did definitely make more sense when I put a dot, like, somewhere in the middle um, of there. Yeah, um, it makes more sense, but it still has Less than limitations. Yeah, it still, it's still has a lot. It still means that if you move closer to one thing, you can move further away. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's, no, there's no additive, because there's nowhere I can put myself on. There, no matter how you're looking at that, there's no way. I think I might have figured out a better way to explain what I just said. Does anybody remember as a kid playing parachute? Like that big old big thing, and you yeah. held it tight, and the ball was in the middle, yes. and then you shook it. I did not have a fun childhood. <laughs> <laughs> You sort of bounce the ball. You yeah. bounce the ball, yeah. and, and the ball would, yeah. you know, and yeah. if you wanted, yeah. wanted the ball to bounce higher, you drop your <laughs> your side of the parachute down, huh. and the ball, of course, would go down yeah. and be gravitated in from the parachute, and that's what I was talking about with string theory. Yeah, yeah, because that's how it works. It's so let's it, let's get to that on this because that's exactly where we're where we're headed. Although we can use string theory words, you can use string theory words, and I can use other words. I don't know string theory words, um, but I saw one other hand. Um, in I, I was just thinking of it as an XY graph in that you can have all the different characteristics. Say, for instance, you moved your dot over two inches to, to the right. To the to your right. Yeah. Okay. So now you're mostly vanilla, a little sub. You know, you're kind of in between all of that. That's right. So this is beginning to look a little bit hold on, like how many of you play um, <coughs> play uh, Dungeons and Dragons? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have dice in my pocket. <laughs> how many of you are familiar with this <laughs> concept? Yeah. <laughs> right, so we have like what is it, neutral, good, neutral, good and evil, and like chaotic mm -hmm. and, and lawful or something. 
in, in D&D. &D. Um, this is actually, um, this is a grid, clearly, x, y graph, etc. And this it is actually, in, when, it, when we talk about sexual orientation, uh, is called the Fritz Klein Sexual Orientation Grid, developed in 1970, I think it was 8? <laughs> what did I not say about that, actually? Yeah, 1978, in a book called uh, The Bisexual Option, A Concept for 100% Intimacy, which I think was a bit of a bit of a hyperbole, but, <laughs> but a good title for a, night, for a book in 1978 about sexuality, right? How many of you are familiar with the Fritz Klein Grid? Several. Awesome. Great, you can let me know if I get anything wrong about this. Um, so the Fritz Klein Grid was trying to essentially complicate the Kinsey scale, right? We had that, we had just, we had, the Kinsey scale was like this, Right? We had that line, line those graphs, those lines. <coughs> Here we have uh, uh, a, a full grid. Yes. Klein was trying to understand why it is that some people are attracted to not just um, uh, uh, was trying to was trying to include one's own gender in this in the model of sexual orientation that mm -hmm. he had available back in again 1978. Um, which I'm sorry to say we haven't actually gone much beyond yet, but we'll get there eventually. Um, and so what he did was he started to, was he asked people who took uh, uh, his quizzes about their own experiences and about their past experiences, about their current desires and their future hopes. He asked them a bunch of questions about what they were fantasizing about sexually, what kind of people they were fantasizing about sexually, and so, and also what opportunities they had. And one of the notable problems with the Fritz Klein grid is that it cannot account for people who have not had the opportunity to find out what they want. It did, however, give us this notion of past and future and so on. And so what it gave you was actually a scatter plot. One person was numerous different points on the scale past, present, and future. And so if we had here, it was male and female, and like, what is it? Uh, straight and gay, right? Mm -hmm. You could be any number of dots here, and you ended up with a graph that was slightly more complicated than you know a number on a Kinsey scale, and tried to give you a sense of what, where you were headed, where you come from, who you are now, who you were, who you'd like to be. Any questions about this? Anything wrong about that? Good? Good on the hood? Sorry? Good on the hood? Great. I still know my shit. <laughs> um, <laughs> any questions about this one? No? Okay. So the other problem with this, right, we, we still have these binaries, we still have these one dimensional uh, uh, visualizations, and that that is still very frustrating. So the next, so I was thinking about this, and I was looking at uh, all these different like models that we've had. I kind of wish I had poster boards so I could go back and flip through them, but you can recall like, we have binary spectrum, we had a gender spectrum, uh, d d d you know, multiple spectrums. We had this circle idea, now we have this grid thing, and I'm like, what the heck is all this gender sexuality stuff, and how am I going to understand who the hell I am on this, and which one fits me best, and always have fucking problems, and I'm really frustrated, and none of these work, and blah, 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 blah. And so then it occurred to me to have to that, it occurred to me to look at a lot of porn, because that's actually really useful for figuring out what you like and what you don't like, which is the thing this thing cannot tell me, right? I, if I did not have uh, the opportunities that I wanted to have, this grid is specifically limited in that it says so on the tin, so to speak. Right? <laughs> that is the disclaimer of this grid. Oh, by the way, if you haven't like had a bunch of experiences and social interactions, we can't help you. Like, oh, well, fuck. <laughs> well, that, that's, that's going to be a problem for me. And so I looked at a lot of porn. And I started to think about what was happening when I was looking at these images. What was I liking about them? What was I like them? What wasn't I liking about them? And I came up with this idea that uh, something called, uh, how many of you familiar with the concept of gaze, as in like uh, um, the male gaze in feminist theories? Mm -hmm. Couple hands. Okay, so for those that whose hands were not up, the gaze is a concept 
which talks about the, the subject-object dichotomy in, in imagery. If I, for example, have a camera, then the camera has my gaze. More often than not, in all visual uh, iconography across the board, we live in a fucking sexist world, men hold cameras. Which is why, when you look at movies uh, in Hollywood, <laughs> at porn on the internet, at images on the walls of sex-positive pubs, what you are normally seeing are things men were looking at. And because you were normally you're seeing what men were looking at, you see these artifacts that showcase their perspective. And the perspective can be, can be, like, it can be evidence in, for example, that extra couple of seconds that they're lingering on that really, really thin, skinny, almost naked actress on the movie screen, just a little bit longer than you think is totally necessary, all the time. Imagine how much time of your life is like just spent looking at that, those little tiny, those tiny, those tiny sections on the movies, multiplied by however many movies we're watching. So the frustration with that, of course, was that I wasn't finding things that I was looking at in porn interesting to me. I didn't understand why, and I'm like, okay, so I'm a submissive, bisexual-ish, genderqueer-ish man, I think. What, what is it, like, you know, this isn't working, maybe I should start looking at male, you know, male erotica, that wasn't working either. And what I realized was that what was happening in the point I was looking at was that it was consistently showing uh, dominance in people I found attractive. So let's say I'm a male submissive and I'm attracted to a female dominant partner. Constantly, what I see in porn is females being dominant, not men being submissive. Mm. Turns out, I'm actually way more attractive to looking at, like I'm way more turned on by looking at men who are being submissive than women who are being dominant. Think about the language, femme dom. It's about female dominance. And so I made a site called malesubmissionart.com, which started to look through uh, a bunch of the internet's available pornography and erotica about, the, about that issue, trying to curate only pictures that had uh, men being submissive as their subject matter, as their main subject matter. This turned out to be revelatory because it completely changed the gates. We now, for the first time ever, had a site on the internet, which is how all this starts, right? The initial porn. Um, in which that gaze was changed or had a, had, a, had a different perspective on it. And when you have a different perspective on it, you can look at things differently. Literally, you have a different perspective. That's what it means. Um, the phenomenology of gaze, in other words, to use academic language, results in, in internalizing what you're looking at. That's why porn is useful for figuring out what you like and what you don't like. As a sexually submissive guy who likes to look at sexually submissive guys to get turned on, you could call me really narcissistic. Um, but I found that, that whole concept very useful. This concept of figuring out where I was looking at changes this, right? We can go back to that that circle. <laughs> Is this making sense so far? It was not okay. If you have questions, please just interrupt me. Because I spent a lot of time thinking about this, but I spent not as much time talking about this. Okay, so we can go back to the circle. Or in fact, you know what? Let's go back to the circle. All right, we have a circle. <laughs> I got these specifically for this. We have a circle. It's kind of like that. What happens when I do this? You see how the circle changes from your perspective, right? This is changing, but you're, but, but th this is the thing that's moving, but you are looking at this differently, and the shape is changing. The literal shape is changing in front of your face. If you moved around the room, I did this, right? The shape changes for me. That's gaze. And you can look at this actually visually if you do. So now we have two circles. And if we have two circles, what we have is a sphere, a three dimensional sphere. This is the most recent form of gender like theory that I've seen articulated, I think, I think first by Kate Bornstein, I'm not totally sure about that, called it gender 
galaxy. Cape mm -hmm. Einstein? Cool. Okay. Now you can be, like you were saying, and like you were saying, in three-dimensional space. So if you imagine yourself as a dot, right, on this chart, right? Let's say, let's say, let's say this is Maymay here. Maybe, maybe he or she. Okay. Right? If that's me, and let's say this is someone that I'm attracted to, my attraction is in part dependent on our perspective to each other. And all of a sudden we have a way to talk about where I am and how and how I'm being gravitated or attracted to you in some other space. If I'm attracted to somebody, their gravity, to use that analogy, which I actually like, um, and haven't used before, so thank you for bringing that up, uh, is it is, is stronger to me, and I'm actually being pulled towards it in a sense. That's what attraction means. Thoughts? Concepts? Yeah. You're adding dimensions to your model and getting a more accurate model. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, how many more dimensions yeah. do you like that? Let's keep going, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> and anyone else anyone ready to keep going? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Anyone thoughts about this one? Okay. Rabbit hole? Okay. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> was there something on this side? Yeah. yeah. I was gonna say part of Strange theory is is that they are realizing that dimensions are becoming infinite. Mm -hmm. They just haven't been able to yeah. how many can we see? How many of the time, by the way? Uh, 108. Okay, so I have how long? 20 minutes? Okay. Good, okay, well, can we help? How many more days can we get out in 20 minutes? <laughs> how long did it take us to get past the gender barrier? 15? So let's add a couple more. Okay, good. So now we have this three dimensional sexuality, galaxy, gender, and galaxy thing, right? That also doesn't just talk about gender, but talks about attraction, but talks about um, other people in it, that talks about ways in which we can conceptualize attraction itself. And we have a much, much better model than any of those totally academic, Fritz Klein, Kinsey scale, you know, PhD, Brad, and I don't have a middle school, right? If I don't have a middle school and start thinking about this, this is no way beyond any of you. We're probably, at, what most of you seem like you have much more schooling than I had anyway. It's not that I could tell by looking at you, but you seem like smart folks. You got this far. Okay. So now we have a gender galaxy. Here's the beautiful thing about things like gender galaxies. We have these dots, and we have these other people in the galaxy, right, that we're attracted to and that we're interested in and that, we're, and that, that we feel um, some kind of genius association with. I need to, okay, this is getting messy. Just a sec. It's too messy. Oh, wait, no, that was actually necessary. Second. All right, destroy part of the galaxy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the lower of minds, destroyer of worlds. I'm gonna totally add that to one of my like comments on the website. <laughs> I keep a list of things people say about me. Keep a list of everything. Um. All right. So. Oh wait, one more. That's right. That's even so messy. All right, so we have the gender galaxy, and we have people in the galaxy that we're attracted to, like that. So, right, so here is someone I'm attracted to. What does that look like? The dyad, binary, a line. This is a poly conference, right? So, let's. Oops. Let's add some people in our gender galaxy. Let's populate the world a little bit, right? Oh, world building phase. <laughs> I'm not that great an artist. But are you are looking at, gen, uh, at attraction as shorter segments? The attractions are the lines, the relationships. Yeah, I, I understand, but yeah. is, is, is more attraction uh, in 
indicated by a shorter line segment? Good question. Yeah. Um, how close together you are in this phase space determines how long the line is, and maybe or maybe not how attracted you are to somebody who's so similar to you. Not quite if you're attracted to similar people, it might it's about perspective. Um, it's, I don't know how to put that in words. Um, let's hear from someone who hasn't talked as much if, if you if you want to share more. So. I thought we were using using sort of universe model to locate ourselves in terms of some characteristics that we might have. So like, you know, maybe in a scenario like we have basically male people at the top and basically female people at the bottom and have, you know, everybody's like some sort of like thing like that. So like the way my point is like the in my interpretation, the line segment is irrelevant. It just shows that you know that these people have attraction. That's it. I don't know. It, it's the thing. It becomes very complicated. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, you, so anyone else? That's easy. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was going to say that, that the length of the line would be relative to the depth of attraction. So let's. So okay, here's the gravity thing, right? They say that when you are in a uh, environment, you know, there was some study I forget exactly what it was, but when you are in an environment in which you are co-working with people, and everyone is really good at their job, and you're not so good, you become better. Um, they also say that same study says if you are working in an environment where people really don't care about their job and you know whatever, everyone's kind of not into it, and they're not that great at it as a result, and you were awesome, and you were, you were like top of your field, and you, you go to that job and work there, you become worse at what you do. You I think I'm trying to, the what? Worse. You become worse at what you do, yeah. Your environment will certainly affect you. In fact, people gravitate, they become like other people. So we can think about this in the sense of like these people are gravitating toward each other, they have a relationship. You could add this, you could add to this snapshot the idea of time, and then you have a moving galaxy where people are actually moving around each other. And that gives you a way to talk about you know, opposites attracting. That's what people say often. Um, but for now, let's just use a snapshot. In the snapshot, we have these dots, we have these lines. It looks a lot like all of the polytules that we draw at poly conferences like this one, right? So now, if this was an intimate network, how many of you were at the keynote the other day? Awesome, so this is gonna make even more sense, right? So if this were an intimate <coughs> network, we have people in relationships. What else does this look like? Start Bingo. Star constellations. Star constellations are relationships between stars. And they say, what is that phrase? We're all stardust? Or what was that? Something more poetic than that. But something along those lines, we're all stardust, you know, we're all moving stardust. Start from dust and then Constellations in uh, stars are not actually stars with lines drawn on the stars. The lines are in our heads. Think about it. Ursa Major, right? The Great Bear. Uh, Taurus, right? The bull. What's the swan? Cygnus, the, right? The swan. Those star constellations are simply shapes in the sky, made of dots that we look at as stars. And these stars are related to each other with these lines we've created to tell stories about the stars. From our perspective, exactly. If we go to Mars, the constellations look very different. Where we stand on the planet affects the star constellations we see. Where we stand in space affects where we see others and how we see them and what we can interpret about it. It literally changes, right? They're shoo. It literally changes their shape. And, and the, the constellations change anyway with the seasons. Like it's 
just the nature of it. They're the not, um, they're not sad. Right. Which is a much better way of thinking about myself than anything that I ever come up with in the past because I'm not sad either. And I really like that about me. <laughs> so, the shapes that are made by things like Cygnus and Taurus and Ursa Major, right? All of those constellations actually have six stars. The meanings that we give those stars, called star constellations, is not defined by the number of stars in the constellation, but rather by the relationships between the stars that they have to each other. That's what makes it literally what gives it its shape, and that's literally what gives us the ability to tell stories about those constellations in different and interesting ways to give those constellations meaning throughout our entire mythos as a human species. It's all about the perspective we're looking at. What else does this look like? We went to stars. Oh, it's, it's like a spider web. Cat's cradle is a great analogy. Looks like cat's cradle with yarn. Makes shapes from the U.S. What else? Beach ball. A beach ball. <laughs> the drawing. Sure. <laughs> it also looks like a beach ball. The drawing. To me, because I think in massively different levels of scale. It also looks like a molecule. Mm. Think about where the word polycule comes from. Right? Polycule, poly shape. As molecules are connected to each other through chemical bonds, and these chemical bonds um, give the molecule a shape from the number of atoms and the kinds of atoms that it has. Right? They're not actually touching each other, they are sharing electrons. And the effect, from one side, one is pulling electrons to the other way, it affects the relationship with another atom on the other side. The bonds differ between the groups? Mm -hmm. Atoms just kind of going Anyone else? I thought I saw with the hand on the side. Yeah. We've added yet another dimension because instead of being simple mathematical points in, in space, in a 3D graph, uh, actual atoms come in 92 different flavors, which determine their uh, the, the nature of their lines between each other. You're talking about the periodic table? Yeah. yeah. 92 that we know of. Natural. Well, that we know of. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what's so beautiful about this, right? This same shape has described us at this level of scale, galaxies and stars at the astronomic level of scale, molecules and atoms at a microscopic level of scale. This is a fractal that extends to all of our levels of scale of the entire universe that we live in. I don't know if another universe's level of scale exists, but that would be interesting. Okay, what this whole talk has been about, I can see where your mathematical brain is working. You think, in, you look for generalizations. You look from one dimension to two dimensions, from two to three, you look for mathematical generalizations. And the question, at me coming from a scientific view of the real world, yes. is at what point do you have to cut away these, uh, the mathematical model to make it match the real world? Because you could have a Hilbert space of an infinite number of dimensions that describes anything and everything, but it's useless because you don't know what's true and false within it. That's a perfect question because that's exactly where these models all uh, break down, right? So so the Hilbert scale, um, I'm not, I'm not, I, I remember hearing about this and I don't remember off the top of my head, but, but I understand it's... Space with an infinite number of dimensions. Right, but there's also like, if, if, if there's a framework and it describes everything, that framework is no longer useful. If a framework is not describing everything, it is useful for the thing that it's describing. But there's another way to put that, I'm forgetting exactly what that, you want to remember that, that phrase? Even I don't have my exo memory, my internet brain. That 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 is um, yes. All of these frameworks, right? All these models. This is entirely about visualizing sexual self identity. 
I don't really want them to be perfect insofar as they are describing the real world. I want my real world, the experience that I have, to be something that informs the models. Because I'm not actually interested in stars and molecules, although those are really useful tools to talk about all of this stuff. I'm actually interested in having a really good time with the people that I love. <laughs> and this helps me do that, which is why this is useful and why I spend so much time thinking about this. Um, does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah, that, so that, and, and, but, but you make a good point, which is all frameworks are inherently flawed. Um, that's but some are less flawed than others. Some less flawed than others. They, they, they have to be, because if you have a framework that encompasses everything, what you've done is create a duplicate of the thing. And what does that flaw do? You, you already have that one thing. Now you have another one. Mm -hmm. It doesn't give you any more insight. Doesn't give you any different check. So one of the ways that yeah. frameworks are very valuable to me is, and I don't know how many works Joyce Lowland, but she kind of kept saying this thing where she was like, "This is a framework to think about stuff. These aren't things aren't real. They're not mocks and stuff." Like and and likewise, like there's no amount of graphs that maybe can draw on the board that will make me stop experiencing the complexity of my real life as complexly as. Um, but it can be valuable for me, like, in trying to navigate through that complexity to have a variety of different tools to sort of, like, lead me on a little bit. Like, if I just need, I'm like, I need a little perspective to get out of this, like, being mired in, like, the details of exactly what's happening. And, 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 I don't know, one of my, like, dead horse safety is the idea that the antidote to bad information is more and so, if there are frameworks that aren't perfect, then if I just have a huge plethora of imperfect frameworks to yeah. draw, then that gives me all kinds of things to like, move around in three-dimensional real world space. The phrase that came to my mind was the whole phrase the map is not the territory. Maps are simplified models, they're much more useful than carrying around a copy of the territory. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. That's and this is what this is what representation is all about, right? When you represent something, you're not actually duplicating it, and that's really important for to, to, to for the, in things like porn and in things like maps and cartography, right? That's both of those things are about representation. I don't want when I look at porn to see what other people think that I'm attracted to. What I want to see is a reflection of me. And that's sadly less available than I'd like it to be, but more available than it was three years ago. Um, okay. Can oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, can you um, illustrate where, say, the dominant, submissive, egalitarian uh, switch, you know, on, on that one? Some of the relationships, so like that guy in the circle, he was a, you know, just kind of see what the relationships so here's are. Here's the next step in that, right? Let's take all this multiple levels of scale thing. And instead of this being an intimate network, because thank you for asking that question. It's exactly the lead in that I needed. <laughs> and then, if I had another board, which I had tested, but doesn't look really real to me now, imagine this copy. Right? Somebody else. And this, let's say, is this person actually? Let's say that's this person. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? This is this dot at a different level of scale. This is Maymay. And then is Maymay dot on that one? Maymay. On the other groups. Maymay would be. Yeah, good. so, okay. This is why I wanted to. Let's do this. Wait, wait, wait. We're talking about the relationship between Maymay, who has many identities, and someone else with many identities, or are we talking about the relationship between both different names? Um, someone else. Okay. This is your lover's lover. You've blown up one of your guns. Yeah. This is me. Yeah. This is Maymay. Is, is that you or is that your relationship? 
Now it's now it's me. We've zoomed in, right? That's that's the beauty of, of this kind of, of of thinking. At least for me, this can be stars, humans, a human molecules. When it's a human, it can be me. So if that's the case, what do the dots? Yeah, that's what I was trying to figure out. What do the dots represent? I drew this a little bit earlier in the keynote. Mm. So the network of relationships that you have is something that's composition of the Yeah. What is a self? We have this belief that a self is this core thing, it's this unchanging piece of you. And if you lose that piece of you, you're suddenly not you anymore. But we've already broken that like a hundredfold. We're not necessarily just through time, right? we don't just change through time, galaxies and things. We are composed of also the relationships we have with other people. There's an excellent TED talk talking about how the brain is structured, and it, it kind of goes into the idea of a watch, we think of a watch as, you know, this thing is, is the watch, mm -hmm. and, but it's made up of the hands, the numbers, the battery, the band, all those things, so all those things make up the watch yeah. as what it is. And that really is actually structured in a very similar kind of fashion. That's an thing this could be, right? <coughs> Neurons. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is how I experience life. Like, this is the closest I've gotten to so far is figuring out how to talk about and think about who I am, how I relate to others, how, and by explaining it, by talking about it, by communicating with others, how they can relate to me. I don't want someone to just relate to me, I want someone to understand the relationship that I have to BDSM, that I have to my other partners, that I have to the passions in my life, that I have to the things I hate in my life, that I have to the people who hate me and who I hate. That's just as important too. And if that is one person, this can be somebody else. And if I can think of them in this way, right? Now we're all these multiple fractals of each other, of, of, of the same shape, of the same construct or concept uh, across that, that to me you know, looks a lot like all the other things in our life that we are literally made of, whether it be stardust or atoms. I like this because of my Translation mechanism, which was also there, and then it's connected that way in our metamorphs too. <laughs> yeah. Or whatever else. So now, and this is the part sort of where our keynote started on Friday, right, at this conference? When we talk about relationships, and we talk about from triad to triadic relationships, we are still only looking, in all of this, we are only looking at the nodes. Right? These are just the dots, this is a dot, this is a dot. Whatever level of scale you want to look at, whether it be a person or you know, a galaxy, we're only still looking at the dots. The keynote from Trans to Triad Relations, but I don't have time for it right now because I know what time is it actually? How are we? Yeah, two minutes. So I don't have time for it right now. But now remember, as I said in the opening keynote, when you look at graphs like this, we are so used to thinking of them only as dots and thinking only of the structural positions of the dots in relationship to each other. That's what poly language gives us, quad, triad, etc. Right, into the middle. But if we also then zoomed into the lines and imagine the lines as first class nodes, we have a whole new, a whole new area to explore. And I literally just begun to do that at this conference at the keynote. Any thoughts on that? Questions on that? Yeah, in, in like two minutes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> There's also a half an hour break. That's true. This is well. This is visualizing sexual self identity. This is this is how I do that. Uh, I hope that this gave you at least some tools to talk about this sort of stuff and yourself and other people and the people that you'd like to talk with. Um, and I hope this gave you some tools to do that. I don't. I could keep going. I have like lots of more thoughts, but that was the presentation that I have. So if you'd like to stick around for a little while, I'm happy to. I'm also really hungry. I haven't had breakfast yet. 
So I like to maybe get um, an avocado, which is actually right here, and eat it. But we can hang out and chat and continue this for a while, or you can enjoy the rest of the conference. But either way, thank you for coming, and I hope this was useful for you.